Hi, I'm Victor Schoenbeck, and today is Wednesday, April the 17th, 2019, and I have the great privilege, pleasure, and honor of recording an interview with Michelle Robin Foreman, who is a distinguished professor and department head in the Department of Nutrition at Purdue University, the Department of Nutrition Science at Purdue University. So, Michelle, thank you again for being willing to do this. This is the day that you'll be giving the H.A. Tyroller Distinguished Alumni Lecture, mm -hmm. and that's a wonderful recognition, um, which, based on the CV that you provided, is very, very richly reserved, uh, deserved. It's a deep honor. I really uh, love Chapel Hill. I have tremendous uh, memories about um, being at UNC in the 70s, and um, I have a commitment as well to the institution even today. So I like to start with something about your parents, where you were born, your early life. So I was born in um, Brooklyn, New York, in Brooklyn Jewish Hospital, um, and my parents quickly moved to Long Island. Um, by the time I was one year of age, I was living on Long Beach, which is an island off of Long Island, and um, uh, with a trestle a train trestle and a bridge connecting us to the rest of Long Island. And I was brought up there. Uh, fabulous um, at the education, the training and education on the high school and the schools there was great. Um, my memories, though, related to public health really come from my um, maternal grandmother, who didn't believe in additives, didn't believe in any sort of um, food preparation that wasn't going to be hygienic and healthy. So this was a woman who had been a flapper in the 1920s, who cooked without mayonnaise, because it could hurt you. She didn't know what was really in it, and put lemon uh, juice with lemon pits in our tuna sandwiches, which we never forgot, um, but who actually um, provided to me an opportunity and a lens in from a woman in much uh, older than I of how health and hygiene are so important. The other part to her was that she believed in her granddaughters and she would have us go from stoop to stoop in Sheepshead Bay, all the different townhouses there, and present who we are to, to people at three and five years of age. So we all became very articulate young women, very young because of her. So that is my first images of some lens into public health. You presented who you were? Were you yes, selling Girl Scout we were, cookies we or were, something? We weren't or, selling or, or Girl Scout cookies, or brownies or whatever. <laughs> we were simply um, being introduced to the neighbors and tell them about yourself, please, Michelle. And tell them yourself about yourself, please, Janice. And this is what my grandma, maternal grandmother was doing. My mother was a fashion model and fashion designer. So there's a lineage of women professionally in different areas. But she started up as off. She was the starter package. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and how about your father? My father was um, a um, chemist slash um, uh, textile person who um, actually thrived in the fashion industry as well. Um, and he um, had a ability to understand the chemistry of textiles, unlike others. And so um, he, I think, I've got my STEM science from him. Because when I went to college, um, we did, you know, aptitude tests in the 60s. I don't know if you did them as well. And lo and behold, I get this aptitude test, and it tells me, you should be in STEM. And I'm going, no, I don't like physics. No, I don't like chemistry. What are you talking about? And, and I wanted to go into psychology. I thought that was a great science. And so um, my advisor, Mr. Smart, that was his real name, uh, said to me, try and mix these two. I don't know how you're going to do it, but try and mix the social sciences and biological sciences, if that's what you're interested in. So that was sort of the first lens that, geez, oh, that's my phone. Um, geez, that. Should we leave it or? Well, we can leave it, but it, I don't know what you're going to do oh. with the tape. Okay, that's all right, we can silence it. Uh, no, I need to silence it. So. Where do I? Oh, it's in my purse, yeah. Sorry. So, no problem. No so, problem. And so, now that you mentioned it, let me silence mine. Because <laughs> I didn't remember to do that. Don't we always have this issue? Okay, so. And that's probably the best idea I could have for the rest of the day. So basically, um, okay, we've got it on silent. Now we're all good. 
So the other thing about my father is that he very much promoted my mother's career. So he was the son of a woman who was a, the editor of a newspaper. And that generation, women didn't edit newspapers, yes. And so he became a promoter of his daughters and his wife. So Wonderful. We were, yeah, we were in a, uh, um, what I think for my cohort, an unusual situation where we had a lot of support as girls growing up from uh, multi-generations, men and women. And so then you ask about how I got here. And I was at Rutgers studying primatology with Jane Lancaster, infections in primates, and studying cross-cultural child rearing and health in children. And I wanted to apply to the medical anthropology program here um, that Tony McMichael had. But the medical anthropology program was tied to the EPI program. And so in an interview in my senior year, I came to Chapel Hill. Uh, it's my senior year of, of uh, university. And I was interviewed by Bert Kaplan. He was part of the medical anthropology program. And Bert said, no, 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 you are not really an anthropologist. You are an epidemiologist. I didn't even know what the word meant. And Bert, in his humble and engaging way, took me down the hall to the main office of the Department of Epidemiology. And when you walked in, I don't know if you remember this, okay. there was John Castle's office to the right mm -hmm. and Al Tyrola's office to the left, right? I do. And Bert ferries me into John Castle's office. And I am this know nothing about epidemiology. And I start telling Dr. Castle and Dr. Kaplan about my work that I was doing as an undergraduate. I was writing a senior thesis. And they both said, read the primer of epidemiology and come back and be a student here. And that's how I first encountered UNC. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I read the primer of epidemiology, which was this thin little book. Um, and I came back and I enrolled in both anthropology and in epidemiology. So I was still going to stay with Tony McMichael on his, um, his track. And I did. Um, and then when I entered the department office, I didn't go to the right, and I went into the right to John Cassidy. said, no, you belong on the other side with Al Roller. And I looked at him. He said, don't worry. I remember who, saying, who said that? John Castle. He said, you belong on the other side. Yeah, you belong on the other side. You're going to be one of our first environmental epidemiology trainees. And last night I found out from Stephanie that I was. And so Al Roller introduced me to the basics of epidemiology. He was great at it. He never had a degree. I don't think I ever had a degree in epidemiology. Not in epidemiology, no. But he, he was brilliant and he was um, very capable of looking into methods and distilling the exact principles that you needed to know. And so I did my Master's of Science in Public Health um, in Smoking and Lung Cancer under Al Tyrola in the Environmental Epidemiology uh, Program. And that set me off. Now, that program had as the courses the principles of epidemiology, which you ask about about 160. And at that era, the principles of epidemiology was taught by John Castle. And it was in this big auditorium. So this year, the year was? Fresh, my first year. And, and that was 1970? 1970, um, 72. Fall 72. Fall 72. That That's was right. the year I took it also. Oh, oh, you were. Well, there you go. <laughs> so the Rosenau Auditorium. Yes, and you remember how it was packed? I do. And you'd come in. I came in late one day. There were no seats. And I'm standing there in the middle of the center of the aisle, you know. And Castle would come in with his three by five cards in his po left hip pocket, you know, and that's all he'd have for his lectures, right? And that would be it. Um, and he'd be good, brilliant lectures. Um, and he saw me and he, he said, come up here, Michelle. Do you remember these big um, chairs? They were like judges' chairs in the back of that auditorium on the stage. <laughs> and he, I didn't remember oh, that. I do, because <laughs> Castle said to me, sit in one of those. And there was no way in God's green earth I was going up to that that podium with him and sitting there. So I sat on the steps. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so embarrassed. I was late, um, and and there I was taking notes um, and being on the steps at the steps of this great titan of epidemiology. It's the only way you could put it. And so we all took, we took principles of epi together. You might have taken Bernie Greenberg's course together, the statistics course you didn't at that I same time. I placed out of the statistics course, oh. so I actually didn't take Okay, that. I took that one at the same time. So 
in my first year, I really had a tremendous um, framework in, um, in epidemiology. And who was your lab instructor? Oh, it was this tall um, faculty member who was in environmental epidemiology. What was his name? You don't mean Carl Shy, do you? No, no, no. Um, uh, dark haired, um, and he worked with Al Tyrol. So, because I was in the environmental epi track, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he did not. He did not stay long at, in Carolina. But the second year, were you a TA with me then? In the second year, no, I was because a TA. I wasn't an epidemiology student then. I oh. was a health education student. Well, I was a no. TA in 160. Uh -huh. But I had students from outside of epidemiology, and it was sure it was incredibly heterogeneous. <laughs> That's the only word for it. And who was your lab instructor that year? Um, that year, I had the same. They person. were taught by faculty, right? The labs right. were taught by faculty. And then I was a TA with him. Mm -hmm. It was the same environmental person. I wish I could remember his mm. name, and I could, okay. I could see it. We can look it up. Um, and so, um, so we, I helped him out. It was a tough ride because, if you remember, we had McMahon and Pew. That was the only real Epi book at the time, right? Mm -hmm. But we were Carolina. That was Harvard. And so I don't know about you, but we had a little bit of tinge on McMahon and Pew at that moment, at that time, and we listened to Castle and his lectures, and um, and garnered from other sources a lot of the principles. I don't think Al Tyrola really taught me a lot from McMahon and Pew, um, doing my ma my masters. So uh, that was my experience with them. But in the second year that I was here, at the end of it. John Castle was going on a sabbatic back to South Africa. Do you remember this? So we no, because I the, wasn't in Epi. So actually, you keep saying other than that course. Okay. So I was in Epi. There was a student room with lots of cubbies in it. Mm -hmm. I remember and that. Ca Castle comes in, and he's about to tell us that he's going to South Africa on sabbatic, and I think uh, Michelle Ibrahim was going to be acting for that year, something like that. And um, he starts talking, and I chime in and say, Oh, you're going to tell us in Zulu what you're going to be doing. He said, would you like to start first in Zulu? And I said, no. <laughs> um, but he did. He was, he was talking to us in Zulu and coming back with his memories of his research and culture change in South Africa. So he sat down with the students and talked to us about these memories. And this was, um, I think, to all of us, one of the most um, important events to the students, the graduate students in epidemiology. He had not taken the, had the time to take, to do this with us. Um, and we listened to him, all the different stories about he and how his wife was a nurse, and so they had worked together um, with in Sydney Salela. Clark, yes, and, us, and Cecil Sloan mm -hmm. was also part of this cohort. And I learned so much in those vignettes from him about culture change and health. Just because he, he it, it was evocative from him about how much he felt about the importance of this area of research. So he went off to um, sabbatic for that year. Um, I finished my master's, mm -hmm. and then he returned. And I did a Master's of Arts in Anthropology under Tony McMichael, so I did my medical anthropology. And then I turned to my doctoral committee, and my doctoral committee had John Castle, Bert Kaplan, two ends of the, of the bookends for me, um, and had Sherman James. I was the first doctoral student for Sherman to chair the doctoral committee. And forever and a day, I said to myself, great to have a clinical psychologist at the helm of a doctor. So he was the chair. He was the chair. Committee. He had just come in, and he was the chair. I said, yeah, actually, he's a, a social chair. psychologist, though. Right. I had okay. So so so, and then I had Ed Wagner as my primary mentor. So mm -hmm. after I finished the Master's of Science, I then went into the doctoral program with a different team because I was really interested already in life course research. I didn't know it as that name, but I looked at the effects of the Great Depression of 1929 on hypertension in adulthood. So babies born in 1928-29. Um, how did that Great Depression influence the risk of hypertension hmm. when they're in their adult years? Wow. And so Castle um, worked with me on paradigm development, mm -hmm. and he would use these words, keep it simple. You have a germ of an idea, and I'd walk out of his office hearing a germ of an idea, and I'd, I'd be